What's up, YouTube? Ryan here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. For this Friday in the second week of Lent, we continue on through the Gospel of Mark. We've got an excellent quote from the Lutheran Church Fathers, and we're continuing our ongoing catechesis, still in the Apostles' Creed, working this way, or this time, through the third article. Stick around. <music> So as we draw to a cl near close on the end of the second week of Lent, we've been reflecting through the Gospel of Mark and watching the way Jesus behaves as he heads to the cross. And we're learning a lot about who the Son of God is and who he is for us. So we continue with that. We're in chapter 8 now, beginning at verse 1. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves. And having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd, and they had a, f a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the bread pieces left over, seven baskets full. And there were about four thousand people. And he sent them away, and immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Now, they had forgotten to bring bread, and they only had one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the five thousand? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, Twelve, and the seven for the four thousand how many baskets full of bread of broken pieces did you take up and they said to him seven and he said to them do you not yet understand interesting to say the least that uh, jesus uh, seemingly repeats a miracle and still the hardness of the heart of man even his disciples, even we Christians, we don't always understand reading from the text or watching what's going on in the world, what Jesus is up to. But as has kind of been the recurring theme throughout this Lenten devotion, faith trusts the promise. Faith gives the problem back to Jesus, and Jesus always provides, and oftentimes in ways we do not expect. So, as we go through this Lenten devotion, this season of, of repentant joy, of, of reflection on our sin and our need for a Savior, and the celebration and anticipation of that Easter season where we recognize and acknowledge and celebrate and cry out with joy that we have such a Savior and Redeemer from sin, that in all circumstances, we simply give our problems back to Jesus. Uh, uh, a wise theologian once said uh, of our sins, leave them where they belong. Don't carry your sins around with you. Jesus took them upon himself. Leave your sins with Jesus. So looking at what, at what he warns us about, this, this, <laughs> our generation is no different. This evil, wicked generation that demands a sign. At one point, Jesus is going to say, you're going to get the sign of Jonah, and that's it. Uh, <laughs> you're going to kill me, and I'm going to rise again. That's it. And that sign Whatever, whatever the church or whatever the world demands of us, whatever proof the world demands of us, whatever miraculous wonders even some Christian denominations proclaim, uh, the sign 
that we cling to, the proof, the authentication of our faith, is that Jesus rose from the dead, and we should be weary of the leaven of such people who demand a sign of us or of Jesus. Faith trusts the promise, and we know by faith that Jesus is risen from the dead and he promises to come back that we might be with him. So we have a writing from the Augsburg Confession, Article 24, uh, for Lutherans, I think this is one of the most important articles that we seem to have forgotten. So let's get in to our writing from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Our churches are falsely accused of abolishing the Mass. The Mass is held among us and celebrated with highest reverence. Nearly all the usual ceremonies are also preserved, except that the parts sung in Latin are interposed here and there with German hymns. These have been added to teach the people. For ceremonies are needed for this reason alone, that the uneducated be taught what they need to know about Christ. Not only has Paul commanded that a language understood by the people be used in church, 1 Corinthians 14, 2 and 9, but human law has also commanded it. All those able to do so partake of the sacrament together. This also increases the reverence and devotion of public worship. No one is admitted to the sacrament without first being examined. The people are also advised about the dignity and use of the sacrament, about how it brings great consolation to anxious consciences, so that they too may learn to believe God and to expect and ask from him all that is good. This worship pleases God. Colossians 1, 9 through 10. Such use of the sacrament nourishes true devotion towards God. Therefore, it does not appear that the Mass is more devoutly celebrated among our adversaries than among us. It is clear that for a long time the most public and serious complaint among all good people is that the Mass has been made base and profane by using it to gain filthy wealth. 1 Timothy 3.3 3. Everyone knows how great this abuse is in all the churches. They know what sort of men say Mass is for a fee or an income and how many celebrate the Masses contrary to canon law. Paul severely threatens those who use the Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 11.27 Therefore, when our priests were warned about this sin, private Masses were discontinued among us, since hardly any private Masses were celebrated except for the sake of filthy gain. Interesting that uh, the, the people that put together the, the treasury of daily prayer have kind of put this together in such a way that Jesus feeds 4,000 people with bread and, and warns about false teachings and abuses of those in religious authority. And then we get this writing from the fathers about retaining the Mass, about proper, cele proper celebration of the Mass, that we've maintained the ceremonies and the rituals and the reverence and the awe for what we're participating in in the Lutheran Church. And we celebrate it with more reverence than Rome because we celebrate it rightly. Because the emphasis is on what Christ gives. He gives his true body and his true blood. And if anyone says that this is a symbol, I refer you back to Paul's word. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of profaning the body and blood of the Lord. If this is just a symbol, then how can eating and drinking in an unworthy manner eat and drink condemnation upon ourselves? How can we be accused of profaning the body and blood of the Lord if it's just a cracker and some Welch's grape juice? This is an incredible conglomeration of, of texts, both from the scripture and from, from the Lutheran Church Fathers and the Augsburg Confession. And it go, harkens back to what I said after the reading, the Lord provides. If we are hungry, we should be hungry for the right things. And the right thing is, is, is the sacrament, and we run to that sacrament because of what and who it is and what and who it gives. This is the strength to sustain our pilgrimage through this barren wasteland. And Lutherans, Lutherans, are you listening? We retain the Mass. None of this once-a-month crap 
None of this every other Sunday crap. Every Sunday, Lutherans, every Sunday, we retain the Mass with its ceremonies. And we celebrate it with more reverence than anyone in all of Christendom. Lutherans. Sorry, had a little bit of inside baseball there. Let's turn to our catechesis, the third article of the Apostles' Creed. Now, you've heard me say earlier this week that the Apostles' Creed is a great proclamation of the gospel, which is why it's worth committing to memory. So we have God the Father. We have his work. We have God the Son, his work of redemption. Now we have God the Holy Spirit in the third article. Three persons, one God. And this is why this is such a proclamation of the gospel. The third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Through this article, the Holy Spirit with his office is declared and shown. He makes people holy. There are many kinds of spirits mentioned in the Holy Scripture, such as the spirit of man, 1 Corinthians 2.11, heavenly spirits, Hebrews 12.23, and evil spirits, Luke 7.21. But God's Spirit alone is called the Holy Spirit, that is, he who has sanctified and still sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit causes our sanctification by the following, the communion of saints, or the Christian church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That means he leads us first into his holy congregation and places us in the bosom of the church. Through the church, he preaches to us and brings us to Christ. For Christ has acquired and gained the treasure for us by his suffering, death, and resurrection, and so on. Colossians 2 3. But if the work remained concealed so that no one knew about it, then it would be useless and lost, so that this treasure might not stay buried but be received and enjoyed. God has caused the word to go forth and be proclaimed in the word. He has the Holy Spirit bring this treasure home. I'm sorry, let me let me try that again. In the word, he has the Holy Spirit bring this treasure home and make it our own. Therefore, sanctifying is just bringing us to Christ so we receive the good which we could not get ourselves. I think it's important uh, in this day and age and, and you know, as, as, okay, so I read from the Augsburg Confession that was a, a declaration against the doctrines of Rome and, of course, prior to that schism of the Reformation, there was a schism between East and West and now, Heaven only knows how many denominations we have. It's important for us as Christians to say, I believe in the Holy Christian Church. We believe in the Church that she is holy, that she is called, gathered, enlightened, sanctified, and preserved by God the Holy Spirit. We believe that by faith because we surely cannot see it. We are broken. We are divided. We are by schisms torn asunder. And that's how the world sees us. But we believe by faith in the church of eternity, the church here in heaven, that we are one holy Christian and apostolic church. The Nicene Creed would say the church of the teachings of the apostles. So it, this, this whole Apostles' Creed, what we confess about God the Father, what we confess about God the Son, what we confess about God the Holy Spirit, the three persons of the Godhead, yet only one Godhead is vitally important and is beneficial when explaining our Christian faith in simple terms to those who, who ask of us and don't understand. We close out this Friday in the second week of Lent with a prayer. Lord Jesus, bread of heaven, in your great compassion you fed the multitudes with a few loaves and a few fish. Feed us the holy food of your word, broken open, that hearts may burn in your very body and blood, that eyes may be opened to see you as the very bread of heaven. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.